This week's video is kindly sponsored by Prosperous Universe. Stick around at the end for more information. Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hujuana and today we'll be taking a look at space elevators, which I feel are often overlooked in science fiction, but for some very good reasons. They are used to carry cargo and passengers to and from space without needing to use energy intensive rockets. So already we have one reason that space elevators get overlooked. They are simply not needed in sci-fi where any old hunk of junk can get to space. Despite that, environmental conditions prohibiting easy space access through flight can lead to space elevator-like structures, such as the gravity hooks on Makeb in Star Wars The Old Republic. There are other reasons elevators are disregarded though, but first I just want to clarify that I'm going to be discussing fairly realistic elevators, not simply very tall buildings that go up above an atmosphere like the Lionsgate spaceport on Holy Terror. But if that isn't really a space elevator, what is? And why isn't a really tall tower good enough? Well, the main issue for very tall buildings is just how tall they would need to be. The generally agreed upon transition to space on Earth is at 100 kilometers altitude, known as the Kármán line, but that's still 120 times higher than the current tallest structure, the Burj Khalifa. A big tower reaching all the way to a usable altitude in space would weigh an absolutely absurd amount and would just collapse in on itself unless it was made from impossible materials. A more realistic space elevator would have to be a tensile structure, a really long cable that holds itself up through tension as the top part wants to fly away from the planet it is attached to, pulling the rest of the cable up. To explain that a bit further, we need to establish a very basic understanding of orbits, since just getting above 100 km altitude may technically put you in space, but you're not going to stay there. To do that, you need to also be going sideways very fast, and above enough of the atmosphere that it doesn't just slow you down again. For example, the International Space Station orbits at around 410 km altitude, four times higher than the Kármán line, but even being way up there, it still requires regular boosts to fight against atmosphere spheric drag. It travels sideways at 7.66 kilometers per second, completing one full orbit around the entire planet in only 92 minutes. It's low enough and bright enough that you can often see it zooming overhead, and it's very easy to find predicted visible passes for your area. Despite this being an accessible altitude for rockets, it isn't very useful for a space elevator since you can't really run a line up to the ISS if it's speeding along at over 7 times faster than the SR-71 speed record. But what about a geostationary orbit? Those maintain their position above the Earth's equator at all times by matching their orbital period, the time to complete one orbit, to Earth's rotation, one day or 1436 minutes. The problem is, to do this requires being at a very high altitude, 35,786 kilometers, or 2.8 times the diameter of the Earth, and 87 times higher than the ISS is. All we need to do is make a 36,000-ish kilometer long line and run it down to Earth. Easy, right? The center of mass of a tether that long would be halfway down its length, or at a semi-synchronous orbit with a 12-hour period. So our space elevator actually needs to have its center slightly above geosynchronous orbit, meaning a tether over 71,000 kilometers long. We can cut that down to something less insane by replacing length of cable above the midpoint with a counterweight of equivalent mass, like a space station or big asteroid or something. We can also use that asteroid, if we use one, as a convenient source of material to build the cable as well, so that makes things a bit easier. Now we have our ridiculously long cable, made out of a material just barely within the realms of being physically possible, unlike the structural impossibility of the really tall tower. This cable hangs in a precarious balance between tension and gravity, loosely anchored to the equator of the Earth at one end, and with a counterweight at the other. Elevator cars, or climber vehicles, or whatever you want to call them, spend hours or days going up and down its length, hopefully without people falling out along the way. This elevator has given the planet very easy access to orbit and beyond, eliminating the need to use rockets to get material to and from space. But if we had the capability to make such a thing in space, surely we'd have a fairly robust space industry already. In my opinion, it doesn't make a great deal of sense to ship things up to space that can be found in space, or vice versa. Though I suppose it would take a long time for space industry to be able to compete with the output of an entire planet. Another issue is that the cable is a massive hazard in the way of practically every other object in orbit, requiring constant adjustment of orbits and the cable to ensure they never ever collide. 
Smaller objects would certainly come off worse in such a collision, but larger objects like space stations would pose a serious risk to the cable. But what happens when the cable breaks? Well, that depends on just where on the cable's length it gets severed, as the forces present on each of the broken parts would vary wildly. The new Mombasa orbital elevator snapped just a couple of kilometres above the ground after it was damaged in Halo 2. This allowed the top part to drift upward into an unstable orbit, leaving the bottom part and its support structure to fall onto New Mombasa and the surrounding area. If you cut the cable somewhere above the midpoint, the top part and counterweight would go careening off into a wild orbit, leaving the rest of the cable to fall down on Earth. But it wouldn't all fall in one place. At minimum, this length of cable would be 36,000-ish kilometers long, and now has nothing keeping it at geosynchronous speed, and nothing holding it up. Just like our semi-synchronous too short idea earlier, its orbital period would now be less than a day on Earth. It would start moving forward in relation to the ground while also falling down, wrapping itself around the planet, leaving devastation in its wake. So, to recap reasons elevators don't show up that much, they may be redundant in a setting with easy space travel, they are on the very limits of material science, they practically require a stable anchor point on the equator, though you could do one that splits north and south, but that has its own problems. They are a hazard for anything in orbit, and if they are severed, they can cause huge amounts of destruction. But despite all these flaws, I still kinda want to see more of them, which I think is largely due to the lower tech setting they would make the most sense in. A near future setting that is less advanced than the Expanse, with its tall chip Epstein drives, but still set on a solar system sort of scale, but perhaps more focused on events going on in the near-Earth environment to cut down on travel times. Such a setting wouldn't even necessarily need to go all the way to a big Earth-based elevator, as it could very easily include a lunar cargo elevator instead, something that I don't think I've ever seen in fiction, though I know you guys will tell me if there is. That would also be far easier to make due to the lower gravity of the moon, as there's simply no need for crazy carbon nanotube tensile strength up there. If there was no elevator on Earth, that would also be a great excuse to include a related technology. Momentum exchange tethers, aka skyhooks. Long spinning cables that yeet their payload, transferring kinetic energy and reducing reliance on regular rocket engines. I suppose what I really want though is just some tougher science for spacecraft in fiction, and I think there's an appetite for that as shown by The Expanse and for all mankind. That near future gap between our current capabilities and whizzing around the solar system in days is fertile ground for popular fiction like TV shows, films and video games to explore. With good characters and a compelling story, perhaps one about those issues with a space elevator, I think something really neat could be created. Big thanks to Prosperous Universe for sponsoring this week's video. Prosperous Universe is a space economy simulator, a lot like EVE Online or the Egosoft X games, which I've talked positively about on Space Dock in the past. But unlike those games, it trims away the space battles and spectacle for pure, unadulterated economic spreadsheet goodness. Full-on, unrefined, weapons-grade organizing. For, I suspect, exactly the sort of person who goes on YouTube and watches videos explaining the exact geometric dimensions of fictional spaceships. Prosperous Universe is channeled through the fantastic Apex interface. It's got this gorgeous, stylized, hard sci-fi kind of look. And in a recent development, the game is now available on Steam for everyone's favorite price, nothing at all. So do check it out in the link below, free to play, see what you like, and fully embrace your destiny as a digital space Ferengi, driving up the price of space turnips and cornering the market on space sanitation services for that very specific kind of satisfaction that these games give you that you can't really hold a particularly interesting conversation about at a party. Go and check it out, you'll be supporting Space Dock, and many thanks to the wonderful, wonderful people at Prosperous Universe for the sponsorship. Thank you for listening, this is Daniel from Space Dock, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.